It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? They are CBS News correspondents Larry Lasseur and Lou Chaffee. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Milton Rosen, head of rocket development for Naval Research Laboratories in Washington. You've often heard it said that uh, science has far outdistanced man's political and social development. But because of the mystery that surrounds science, one has a feeling that tremendous developments are in the offing which might catch us unawares. And one of those mysteries, of course, surrounds the space rocket. Mr. Rosen, as head of the development of the space rocket, you've shot a rocket higher than any other man has done. Now, do you think men will soon be liberated from the bonds of Earth and travel around in space? Well, Mr. Lasser, I think they will be liberated, as you say, eventually. How soon, I do not know. Well, how will this come about? Will uh, man go up in a rocket, or can that be done now? Well, I think that uh, first we will explore with instruments. Uh, at the present time, rockets have gone up almost to 200 miles, but men have only gone up to about 15 miles. And the same story will be repeated in outer space. First instruments will be sent up in satellites, later men, and uh, so on with the uh, exploration of the moon and other planets. Now, that model of a rocket that uh, is on the desk there, is that the, uh, the famous Navy Viking, which has, you've shut off the single-stage rocket? Yes, that's, that's a model of a Viking. And that is not for military use, but for exploration in space, is it? Yes, it's uh, devoted to upper atmosphere research. The nose and uh, a good part of the rocket is packed full of instruments to study the sun, to determine the pressure, composition of the atmosphere, to study cosmic rays, to study the ionosphere, all the things that interest scientists. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Rosen, you talk about rockets. Uh, what is the difference between a rocket and a guided missile and a jet, uh, these terms we hear so frequently? Well, a uh, guided missile is probably the broadest term, and there are rocket-guided missiles and jet-guided missiles. The jet, as, in, as used in jet aircraft, is, is really an air-breathing engine. It's an engine that operates within the Earth's atmosphere and therefore would always fly relatively close to the Earth's surface. A rocket, however, doesn't need air from the atmosphere. It carries its own oxygen and it can operate outside the atmosphere and therefore it is the type of vehicle, the type of propulsion that will eventually be used in outer space. Mr. Rosen, you said that uh, you couldn't say how soon men would be traveling in space, but do uh, you think that the generation which is now watching uh, space travel on TV will go out into space in their lifetime? Well, it's hard to say. I think they'll see a, a tremendous uh, advance, and uh, <clears throat> a lot of this depends on how hard we work at it. I feel it's inevitable, and uh, that our youngsters will see a, a lot more than we have. Mr. Rosen, uh, I'm searching for definition tonight. Uh, what is a satellite? Uh, a satellite is a vehicle that orbits or circles around the Earth continuously. Uh, the satellites that have been spoken about recently, uh, instrumented satellites that uh, are being studied, would say travel about a thousand miles above the surface of the Earth. And therefore, they would complete a, an orbit or circuit around the Earth in about two hours. In other words, if you shot a rocket outside of the Earth's gravitational pull and not into the gravitational pull of another planet, it would stay there and travel around the Earth as one of our satellites? Well, uh, any satellite would be almost entirely under the influence of the Earth. And the pulls of the other planets would be so minute that they wouldn't matter. The pull of the moon would probably be more important to a, to a satellite about the Earth. 
Well, if, uh, if you think space travel, and I think that implies that uh, human beings would be traveling, is not in the foreseeable future, nevertheless, how about this idea of shooting a rocket so high that it would uh, go out of the Earth's gravitational pull and become a satellite? Is that in the foreseeable future? Oh, yes. I, I think uh, such a, a vehicle is within our grasp now, and that if a concerted effort were made, that we could, in very short time, have an instrumented satellite circling around the Earth. Well, do you think it would be any uh, a great advantage or any possible danger to the rest of the world if uh, one nation or another uh, did build a, a satellite or a platform, perhaps, that was circling the Earth and could watch the rest of the world go by from their advantageous position? Well, I don't think there would be any danger. The uh, possible military use of, of a satellite has been greatly overrated. And uh, even this uh, point that you raise of watching other people is going to be very difficult. The first satellites will be used mainly for scientific experiments and collecting data about the region, studying cosmic rays. Now how exactly would you get uh, uh, such a satellite uh, up above the Earth? Well, it would be a rocket, and as most people have said, it would probably be a three-stage rocket. Uh, starting with a large rocket, which then pushes a, a smaller rocket, the middle rocket, to a high altitude, and then this one takes over, and finally the third or last rocket would have enough speed to climb into an orbit and stay there. Do you think it would be possible at any point to uh, station men up there to have a, like a kind of a roving city circling the, the Earth? Well, this is a great distance away from an instrumented satellite and the, the practical problems of, of uh, getting any large amount of material up, up to uh, a satellite orbit are, are the things that make it very difficult. Are these what you are learning about now in these uh, shoots from, uh, from uh, Sandia Air Base and White Sands? And the shooting of your Viking rocket, uh, is that what you're learning about now, the difficulties of transporting men up to outer space? No, not necessarily men. We're, we're learning about the difficulties of operating rockets and the difficulties of making equipment work. But we learn enough about that to show us how difficult it would be to maintain a man up there, to maintain all the equipment necessary to give him air, to keep him from freezing or, or roasting, uh, to protect him against cosmic rays and radiation, to uh, uh, protect him against weightlessness. See, uh, Mr. Rosen, would you think you'd have any difficulties in getting volunteers to go up in a rocket even now? I, I doubt it. Uh, a lot of people have volunteered to go up. Then why don't you send a man up there then? Well, we see little uh, useful purpose in doing it. So much effort would have to be expended on protecting that one man that uh, we could more profitably send instruments do the work. And these instruments do tell you what is taking place in the upper atmosphere at the moment, as well as a man could? Probably better, because uh, you can do a variety of things with instruments. A man cannot count cosmic rays, but a Geiger counter can. Mr. Rosen, what's the difference between your uh, uh, research rocket and the rockets used for uh, military purposes as weapons? Well, they are usually more rugged, whereas uh, our rocket is built primarily for efficiency to reach very high altitudes. Also, uh, the Viking isn't built particularly to hit any target. Its object is to reach the highest altitude and uh, to send back information to the ground by radio. Mr. Rosen, what is the most difficult problem you have to overcome in, uh, in we'll say, going to the moon? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I think we're faced with a, a multitude of problems, uh, all of which have practical difficulties. In theory, none of these problems are really very difficult. It's when you have to build something to do the job that you run into a lot of practical trouble. Well, Mr. Rosen, uh, one question I would like answered is, why go to the moon at all? What practical uh, benefits can we get from going to the moon? Well, it's very hard to say. Uh, there are certainly people who will see benefit just in the exploration. The benefit to science, uh, I think there's a lot to be said for discovery, finding out new things, 
After all, the upper atmosphere is now the last earthly frontier. If we want to discover new regions, we have to go away from the Earth. I see, Mr. Rosen, you're a member of the American Rocket Society. Do you think it would be worthwhile, uh, do you enthusiasts think it would be worthwhile to start a crash program like the one we employed to build the atom bomb in order to uh, build a rocket that would go to the moon? As, as much as, as many of us would like to see such a program, if we do any wishful thinking, uh, I think we should take a more gradual approach. I think we should concentrate on, the, on instrumented rockets, on learning more about the problems before we attempt any big program for, say, the exploration of the moon. Mr. Rosen, the fact that you are a, uh, a space expert uh, leads me to a question I think I have time for. That's the question of, about flying saucers. They've been just, uh, there've been reports that they've been seeing uh, some sort of uh, objects in the sky in Italy now. Now, as a space expert, do you think there's anything in these flying saucer stories? Well, I, I think the people are seeing something. What it is, I don't know. And there have been many explanations, uh, any one of which I think might be plausible. One of the explanations, of course, is that uh, these saucers are visitors from outer space. Until there is some tangible proof of that, I, I can't accept that as the final explanation. I see, but you do think there is something to it. But I want to thank you very much for being so interesting, asking so many questions tonight, Mr. Rosen. Thank you. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Lou Choffey. Our distinguished guest was Milton Rosen, head of rocket development for Naval Research Laboratories in Washington. To give a Longines watch this Christmas is to give just about the finest watch made anywhere in the whole world. And yet, unbelievably, a Longines watch is not costly. There are many outstanding Longines watches, perfect for Christmas giving, priced as low as $71.50. Longines ladies' watches are superb examples of the jeweler's art. Exclusive in style, exquisite in taste and finish, incomparable in timekeeping. There's a model for every taste and for every occasion. The variety of Longines watches for men is equally extensive. There are watches for dress and sport. Longines automatic watches, the most advanced in the world. Longines waterproof and shock resistant watches for rugged service. Longines chronograph watches for sportsmen and scientists. And every Longines watch, whether for a lady or for a gentleman, is made to the unique standards of excellence which have won for Longines 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Yes, to give a Longines watch this Christmas is to give just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world. And yet we repeat, you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. <laughs>